I guess one accurate descriptive of settlers filtering early on in current Pennsylvania is thrifty. While working the land with farms and plantations mixed with pockets of religious zeal, including adherence to William Penn's quote, holy experiment, created a solid foundation for European-style civilization, Pennsylvanians also discovered resources to drive an industrial framework supplying the rest of the new United States. Lumber from the western forests, coal from the hill country, and eventually oil too, gave entrepreneurs the fuels to manufacture steel and contribute to the nation's demand for more efficient transportation. Pennsylvania, a second colony to turn state, essentially is strategically located as an eastern coast hub, moving products north to south and back north again, and even early on, westward to the Ohio country and beyond. Beginning in 1820, large mining companies were formed to exploit Pennsylvania's deposits of hard and soft coal, and in 1859, Edwin Drake drilled the world's first successful oil well at Titusville. The state promptly became a leading producer of textiles, ships, lumber, tobacco, and prominently iron and steel. Pennsylvania was the nation's second most populous state for a long period extending into the 20th century. As mentioned past, Pennsylvania had three capitals, first Philadelphia, then for a relatively brief time, Lancaster, and finally a central place, Harrisburg, alongside the Susquehanna River. Considerable controversy apparently preceded the migration of the capital, finally to the middle of the state. A conference held in 1788 led to a report laying out disputes and first-time arguments for uniting the territory by transferring the powers of state governance eventually to Harrisburg. In 1791, Harrisburg became incorporated, and in October 1812, it was named the Pennsylvania State Capital, which it has remained ever since. The legislature of the state had designed Harrisburg to supersede Lancaster two years before in 1810. Here I quote from a review of the Harrisburg Conference, September 1788, published in the Harrisburg Daily Patriot in its issues from November 10 to November 18, 1879, authored by Adam Boyd Hamilton. Quote, in the soft atmosphere of the early days of September 1788, the banks of the Susquehanna must have been, radiant in autumnal beauty, clad in vestments gold and red, stood the stately forests, tossing high a haughty head. Unfortunately, we have no record, at least none that I can hear of, of the impression it made upon the members of the conference. We are, therefore, at liberty to suppose that the question of a site far from Philadelphia for a permanent seat of government was discussed, which at length led to the choice of Harrisburg. Unquote. The original state house design was elaborate, but too expensive to complete. Dissatisfied with the end result, in 1901 the legislature again issued a design competition to complete the existing Cobb Capital. A young aspiring Philadelphia architect named Joseph Houston won the competition. With declared intention to make this building, or his building, 
one of the most brilliant architectural and artistic public governmental seats in America. He modeled the building in the Renaissance Revival style, imitating many buildings in Europe, such as the Paris Opera House and St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Construction began in 1902 and lasted until October 1906. At least 50,000 people came on special Pennsylvania Railroad excursion trains to Harrisburg to hear President Theodore Roosevelt dedicate the building. It is the handsomest state capital I have ever seen, Teddy declared. Colonel John Butler had led a force of a thousand loyalists and Indian allies against the 5,000 inhabitants of the valley, mostly American women and children gathered at Forty Fort. About 300 men and boys left the protection of the fort to meet the attackers. When the smoke and shouting ceased, 360 men, women, and children lost their lives. Some who escaped to the forest died of starvation or exposure. The Young Men's Christian Association, or YMCA, was founded in London, England in June 1844, purportedly to address social inequities arising in the cities during the Industrial Revolution, a period extending roughly from 1750 to 1850. It was championed as an alternative to street Bible study and prayer for young men displaced by intense labor and isolation in unsavory living quarters. The first YMCA in the U.S. opened on December 29, 1851 in Boston, Massachusetts. Captain Thomas Valentine Sullivan, an American seaman and missionary, is credited with its American founding. While the organization was already flourishing in many nations, its successes and failures varied as societal changes emerged and sometimes as wars siphoned off the men served by the association. George Stewart, founder of the Philadelphia YMCA and head of the Y's efforts in the Civil War, said that there is a good deal of religion in a warm shirt and good beefsteak. Illustrating the pragmatism of Pennsylvanians in general, I suggest, there is a quote from a 19th century report issued by the Harrisburg YMCA. President's Report, 1884, in its 29th year. The retrospect of the work of the year just closed shows us much failure, of opportunities neglected or slighted, of misspent energy perhaps in some directions, and wasted labor in unfruitful fields. But we hope that from these failures and misapplied efforts, lessons have been garnered, which will make even failures blessings in disguise. The experience gained has brought knowledge of what to avoid, and in the light of that knowledge, we put up the danger signals and move on to our future work. But while regretting failure, we are cheered by the greater measure of success that has attended us,
By the 1830s, the original Quaker opponents of austere living were diminishing, while other German groups like the Amish and Mennonites positioned themselves in stabler, self-sustaining communities. Gustav Beaumont, friend and traveling companion of young Alex de Tocqueville, observed in October 1831 that the number of Quakers, quote, is not very large. The severity of their doctrine is ill-matched to an advanced civilization, which cannot exist without indulging many vices incompatible with their principles. They lose adherence daily. Clearly this sect is headed for utter ruin. Nevertheless, it did a great deal of good. The Quakers created a free, moral, and hard-working society. It is to be hoped that this society will work as well without them as it did with their assistance. 1831. I already alluded to the strong German flavor of Pennsylvania's early inhabitants. Quote, Pennsylvania was the distributing center for the German immigrants, whence German settlers spread over all the neighboring provinces. Quoted from Professor Faust in Bolton and Marshall's book. But other mass migrations in the 18th century also occurred simultaneously from Switzerland, Scotland, and Ireland. Pennsylvania, the second state to ratify the U.S. Constitution, today in the 2000s is still among the top five most popular states in the country. Its largest city, Philadelphia, was once the capital of the New Republic, named such in 1790. The region has also been fertile ground, not only for agriculture, but also for political and social turmoil. The Whiskey Rebellion in 1794 pitted western Pennsylvania against a federal government tax on distilled spirits. A hot water rebellion in southwestern Pennsylvania in 1799 was suppressed by state militia. Lancaster was named the state capital that same year. Pittsburgh Gazette purportedly was the first newspaper west of the Alleghenies. The nation's first iron furnace began operating in that city in 1793. A paved Philadelphia-Lancaster turnpike was already in place in 1795, the first of its kind in the country. The U.S. Capitol had already moved from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in 1800. Lancaster County remains the state's largest agricultural producer. In 2021, Pennsylvania generated about $7.5 billion in agricultural cash receipts, with the highest valued commodities being dairy products, especially milk, and miscellaneous crops, especially corn and some tobacco, and cattle and calves. Amish farmers in the past had been prolific tobacco croppers, 
There are barns distinctively built with hinge slats that can be opened to circulate air and facilitate the drying of tobacco leaves. The tobacco the Amish have farmed for generations is designated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as, quote, Pennsylvania 41, unquote, which is a heavy-bodied, dark-colored gummy leaf. The tobacco is sold mostly for cigar filler and chewing tobacco. Tobacco is still a significant cash crop in Pennsylvania, especially for Amish and Plain farmers. According to reports, 7,000 acres were harvested in 2022 statewide, worth an estimated $46 million. Between 80 and 90 percent of the state crop is grown in Lancaster County. Ironically, it is the Mennonites who shun tobacco use, while Amish men and boys are known to chew tobacco and smoke cigars. During my visit to the state in August and September, another or less ubiquitous crop, but eye-catching, is the sunflower. Fields of sunflowers dot the landscape from east to west. Pennsylvania is not a major producer. North Dakota is the largest harvester, but their rallies by the roadside remind me of the plains of the Midwest. Kansas actually is dubbed the sunflower state. The Susquehanna River Valley, and to some extent the Delaware Valley, quenched the pioneer thirst for commerce and trade in the center of the new state. Out west, a large city arose, namely Pittsburgh, tapping into the state's western waterways, draining into the Allegheny, Monongahela, and ultimately the Ohio River. 
Pennsylvania was the wild west of the 18th century America. West Virginia, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky were still the frontier. Today, Pittsburgh no longer reflects the industrial town aura fostered earlier by the likes of Andrew Carnegie, George Westinghouse, and Henry Clay Frick. Tuckville and his friend Gustave de Beaumont passed through Pittsburgh only briefly, quote, in a tornado of snow. In the early 1830s, the city streets were still of mud and pigs frolicked unchecked. According to Beaumont's travel notes, quote, We arrived in Pittsburgh, the most industrial town of Pennsylvania, the Birmingham of America, where the air is constantly obscured by the multitude of steam engines that run the shops. Tocqueville and Beaumont lodged for a considerably longer period during October 1831 in eastern Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, a life filled with, quote, prisons, learned societies, and salon gatherings in the evening, unquote. Their objective really was to complete a report on the American penitentiary system. A Quaker-inspired prison had just opened in the vicinity, reportedly championing prisoner reform principles of solitary confinement, religious instruction, and hard work. The 1800s were similarly an era of dynamic change and citizen participation in facilitating the movement of people and goods westward as Pittsburgh tapped the resources of the Erie Triangle, hosted a new bank in 1804, and became a major depot for the first stagecoach line westward. By this time, the famed Conestoga wagon was widely used in the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia region, the Middle States to transport farm goods and product like corn and barley to market. The Mennonite German settlers living near the Conestoga River, a Susquehanna River tributary, apparently designed the heavy wagons, almost 20 feet long, with curved sides and hoops to position taut canvas covers to maneuver the rough roads of the day. Their use, however, were not intended or used for the vast prairie migration of settlers in the 19th century, as often misreported in our times. The western wagons, or so-called prairie schooners, covered wagons averaging closer to 12 feet long, with flatbed design, actually were much lighter than the heavier, less maneuverable Conestogas.
Finally, I suggest that the steel furnaces of Pennsylvania contributed significantly to the eventual transportation revolution driven by steam engines. The railroad era coincided with the steamboat flotillas, weaving a fabric of commerce across a still infant nation. Robert Fuller built the first steamboat in 1811 at the confluence of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers at Pittsburgh. Early creative engineering efforts constructed conveyances like efficient covered freight wagons hauled by animals and developed canals and paved paths for human traffic. But trade volume and large distances to be crossed nudged American ingenuity to the adoption of monster machines that made a lot of noise and smoke but delivered the goods to settlements, including Pittsburgh, growing exponentially from New York to the Great Plains and then on to the Pacific Ocean. Since the borough's founding in 1816, Strasburg, Pennsylvania earned a nickname of Train Town, bordering the bustling village of Lancaster. A Frenchman, Pierre Bazalian, set up camp here in 1693. At that time, he initiated trade along the ancient Native American trail known as the Old Conestoga Road with local Delaware Indians. Huguenots from France's Alsace region moved in also. Strasbourg became a halfway station for travelers and teamsters or drivers of the Conestoga wagon. The first steam locomotive was actually patented in Britain in 1802. Strasburg's railroad is the oldest continuously operating shortline railroad in America today. When the Philadelphia Lancaster Turnpike was opened, travel along the old Conestoga Road decreased. Other rail connections north of Strasburg prompted the community to support the founding of the Strasburg Railroad in 1832, making a connection to the mainline freight service. Functioning as a short-line railroad, its main purpose eventually was to connect a rural feed mill with the larger Pennsylvania Railroad. The Philadelphia-based Penn Railroad was founded in 1846 and probably became the nation's single most important railroad, carrying 10% of all freight in America and 20% of all passengers, at least for a while. Today, the Pennsylvania Railroad itself is history. Apparently, more than 50 different entities now use former Pennsylvania Railroad lines. <laughs>